the garden like a lady fair was cut, that lay as if she slumbered in delight, and to the open skies her eyes did shut. The azure fields of heaven were assembled right, in a large round set with the flowers of light, the flowers to loose in the sparks of dew, that hung from the azure leaves did chew, like twinkling stars that sparkle in the evening blue. Jaws Fletcher From his cradle to his grave, a gale of prosperity bore my friend Ellison along. Nor do I use the word prosperity in its mere worldly sense. I mean it as synonymous with happiness. The person of whom I speak seemed born for the purpose of foreshadowing the doctrines of Turgeau, Price, Priestley, and Condorcet, of exemplifying by individual instance what has been deemed the chimera of the perfectionists. In the brief existence of Ellison, I fancy that I've since that I've seen refuted the dogma that in man's very nature lies some hidden principle, the, anta the antagonist of bliss. An anxious examination of his career has given me to understand that in general, from the violation of a few simple laws of humanity, arises the wretchedness of mankind, that as a species we have in our possession the as yet unwrought elements of content, and that even now, in the present darkness and madness of all thought, on the great question of the social condition. It is not impossible that man, an individual, under certain unusual and highly fortuitous conditions, may be happy. With opinions such as these, my young friend, too, was fully imbued, and thus it is worthy of observation that the un uninterrupted enjoyment which distinguished his life was, in great measure, the result of preconcert. It is indeed evident that with less of the instinctive philosophy of which now and then stands so well in the stead of experience, Mr. Allison would have found himself precipitated by the very extraordinary success of his life into the common vortex of unhappiness which yawns for those of preeminent endowments. But it is by no means that my object to pen an essay on happiness. The ideas of my friend may be summed up in a few words. He admitted but four elementary principles, or more strictly, conditions of bliss. That which he considered chief was, strange to say, the simple and purely physical of one of free exercise in the open air. The health, he said, attainable by other means, is scarcely worth the name. He instanced the ecstasies of the fox hunter and pointed to the tillers of the earth. The only people who, as a class, can be fairly considered happier than others. His second condition was the love of a woman. And the third, and most difficult of realization, was the contempt of ambition. His fourth was an object of unceasing pursuit, and he held that, other things being equal, the extent of attainable happiness was in proportion to the spirituality of this object. Ellison was remarkable in his con continuous profusion of good gifts lavished upon him by fortune. In personal grace and beauty he excelled, all, exceeded all men. His intellect was that of order, to which the acquisition of knowledge is less a labor than an intuition and necessity. His family was one of the most illustrious of the empire. His bride was the loveliest and most devoted of women. His possessions had always been ample, but on the attainment of his majority it was discovered that one of those extraordinary freaks of fate had been played in his behalf, which startled the whole social world amid which they occur, and seldom fail radically to alter the moral constitution of those who are in their objects. It appears that about a hundred years before Mr. Ellison's coming of age there had died in a remote province of one Mr. Seabright Ellison. This gentleman had amassed a princely fortune, and having no immediate connections, conceit the whim of suffering his wealth to accumulate for a century after his decease. 
minutely and sagaciously directing the various modes of in investment, he bequeathed the aggregate amount to the nearest of blood, bearing the name of Ellison, who should st be alive at the end of the hundred years. Many attempts had been made to set aside this singular bequest, their ex post facto character rendered them abortive, but the attention of a jealous government was aroused, and a legislative act finally obtained, forbidding all similar ac accumulations. This act, however, did not prevent young Ellison from entering into possession on his 21st birthday as the heir of his ancestor Seabright of a fortune of 450 millions of dollars. When it was Become, when it had become known that such an enormous wealth inherited, there were, of course, many speculations as to the mode of its disposal. The magnitude of the immediate availability of the sum bewildered all who thought on the topic. The possessor of any appreciable amount of money might have been imagined to perform any one of a thousand things. With riches merely surpassing those of any citizen, it would have been easy to suppose him engaging to supreme excess in the fashionable extravagances of his time, or busying himself with both political intrigue, or aiming at ministerial power, or purchasing increase of nobility, or collecting large museums of virtue, or playing the munificent patron of letters of science of art, or endowing and bestowing his name upon extensive institutions of charity. But for the inconceivable wealth and the actual possession of the air, these objects had all the ordinary objects were felt to afford too limited a field. Recourse was had to figures, and these but sufficed to confound. It was seen that even at three percent the annual income of the inheritance amounted to no less than thirteen million and five hundred thousand dollars, which was one million and 125,000 per month, or 36,986 per day, or 1,541 per hour, or six and twenty dollars for every minute that flew. Thus the usual track of supposition was thoroughly broken up. Men knew not what to imagine. There were some who even could see that Mr. Allison would devise himself at least one half of his fortune as of utterly superfluous opulence, enriching whose troops, whole troops of his relatives by division of his superabundance. To the nearest of these he did, in fact, abandon the very unusual wealth which was his own before the inheritance. I was not surprised, however, to perceive that he had long made up his mind on the point which had occasioned so much discussion to his friends, nor was I greatly astonished at the nature of his decision. In regard to individual charities, he had dissatisfied his conscience, and the possibility of any improvement, properly so called, being affected by man himself in the general condition of man. He had, I am sorry to confess it, little faith. Upon the whole, whether happily or unhappily, he was thrown back, in very great measure, upon self. In the widest and noblest sense of he was a poet, he comp comprehended, moreover, the true character of the august aims, the supreme ma majesty and dignity of the poetic sentiment. The fullest, if not the sole proper satisfaction of the sentiment, he instinctively felt to lie in the creation of novel forms of beauty. Some peculiarities, either in this early education or in the nature of his intellect had tinged with what is termed materialism in all his ethical speculations. And it was this bias, perhaps, which led him to believe that the most advantageous, at least, if not the, most, the sole legitimate field for the poetic exercise, lies in the creation of novel moods of purely physical loveliness. Thus it happened, he became neither musician nor poet if we use this latter to term in its everyday exception. Acceptation. Or it might have been that he neglected to neither. 
either merely in pursuance of his idea that in contempt of ambition is to be found in one of the essential principles of happiness on earth. Is it not indeed possible that while a high order of genius is necessary necessarily ambitious, but the highest is above that which is termed ambition? It may not thus happen that many far greater than Milton have contentedly remained quote-unquote mute and inglorious. I believe that the world has never seen, or and that unless through some series of accidents goading the noblest order of mind into distasteful exertion, the world will never see that full extent of triumphant execution in the richer domains of art of which the human nature is absolutely capable. Nelson became neither musician nor poet, although no man lived more profoundly and enamored of music and poetry. Under other circumstances than those which invested him, it is not possible that he would have become a painter. Sculpture, although in its nature rigorously poetical, was too limited in its extent and consequences to have occupied at any time much of his attention. And I have now mentioned all the provinces in which the common understanding of the poetic sentiment has declared it capable of expatiating. But Ellison maintained that the richest, the truest, and the most natural, if not altogether the most extensive province, had been unaccountably neglected. No definition had sp spoken of the, the landscape gardener as of the poet. Yet it seemed to my friend that the creation of the landscape garden offered to its proper muse the most magnificent of opportunities. Here indeed was the faintest field for this display of the imagination in the endless combining of forms of novel beauty, the elements to enter into combination being by vast superiority the most glorious which the earth could afford. In the multiform and multicolor of the flower and the trees, he recognized the most direct and energetic efforts of nature at physical loveliness. In the direction or concentration of this effort, or more properly, in its adaptation to the eyes which were meant to, to behold it on earth, he perceived that he should be employed in the best means, laboring to the greatest advantage in the fulfillment not only of his own destiny as poet, but of the august purposes for which the deity had implanted the poetic sentiment in man. Its adaptation to the eyes which were to behold it on earth, in his explanation of his phraseology, Mr. Allison did much towards solving what has always seemed to me an enigma. I mean the fact which none but the ignorant dispute that no such combination of scenery exists in nature as the painter of genius may produce. No such paradises are to be found in reality as have glowed in the canvas of Claude. In the most enchanting of natural landscapes, there will always be found a defect or an excess, or many excesses and defects. While the component parts may defy individually the high skill of the artist, the arrangement of these parts will always be susceptible of improvement. In short, no position can be attained on the wide surface of the natural earth from which an artistical eye, looking steadily, will find matter of offense in what is termed the composition of the landscape. And yet how unintelligible is this in all other matters we are justly instructed to regard nature as supreme. With her details we shrink from competition. Who shall presume to imitate, imitate the colors of the tulip, or to improve the proportions of the lily of the valley? The criticism which says of sculpture or portraiture, that is, here nature is exalted, to be exalted, or idealized rather than imitated, is an error. No pictorial or sculptural combinations of points of human loveliness do more than approach to living and breathing beauty. The landscape alone is a principle 
of the critic true. And having felt the truth here, it is but the headlong spirit of generalization which had led him to pronounce it true throughout all the domains of art. Having, I say, felt the truth here, for the feeling is no affectation or of chimera, 